Hello everyone, I am the Lore Explorer and this is Outer Wilds, a handcrafted exploration game with a simulated solar system full of interesting phenomena. While playing the game, most of these effects do get explained to us in one way or another, but there are a few things in the game that go unexplained throughout. It would be fine to just say they're artistic or storytelling reasons, but I'm the Lore Explorer, so in today's loop, I thought we could have a little fun by trying to come up with reasonable, real-world explanations for these phenomena. As always, this video will contain spoilers for Outer Wilds. The first big example of this is the sand pillar that begins to drain from Ash Twin to Ember Twin. At first glance, we might just write it off that you know, this is some cool science fiction thing that they decided to add, but I think that it helps to visit Ash Twin before the sand starts draining off to see what's happening there. With the help of mods or a very fast flight, we have enough time to actually see what's going on with the surface of Ash Twin before it starts draining. If we stop and watch the surface, we can see that it isn't a static object. The sand is absolutely already moving around the surface due to tidal forces present here. It almost looks as if the sand swells were waves in an ocean. And not only that, but the gravity here varies wildly. I've seen the gravity here bounce from around 1.4 to like 0.6 in comparison to Timber Hearth's gravity. The gravity from Ember Twin and the close gravitational pull of the sun really tugs and pulls on Ash Twin's surface in different ways. When the sun and Ember Twin are on opposite sides of Ash Twin, the gravitational pull is fighting each other and tugging the sand in different directions. But when Ember Twin and the sun are on the same side of Ash Twin, their combined gravity is tugging on the Ash Twin sand together, pulling everything the same way. Now logically, it would make some sense that when the gravitational forces lined up, the tidal forces may win and the sand pillar could begin. But if you think about tides and what is happening, essentially the other bodies are tugging on the material here on the planet. They're essentially trying to steal that material from the surface. And if the gravity is great enough, this can cause a little bulge of matter. But usually this matter can't be stolen as the local gravity greatly outweighs the gravity felt by far off forces. But in theory, if these far out forces were eventually to win somehow, we'd see this bulge turn into a pillar like exactly what we see in the game, as it extends towards its destination. This does seem to describe what we are seeing, but it seems to me that this alignment would actually happen quite often, while the Outer Wilds venturers tell us that this is a periodic switch between the two planets. Now, we can just mark this up to a very co-artistic cool choice with no real explanation, but I think we can add one more thing to the equation that may allow us to explain it a bit better. Now, I won't claim to understand it all that well, but as the planet naturally slows down while it's at its apogee, the sand on the surface would want to continue moving at the speed it was already moving at before the planet slowed down. If the planet was moving in the exact right direction that aligned with the tidal forces of the Sun and Ember Twin, then maybe it would sort of add to the natural tidal bulge as all the sand is trying to keep moving. Maybe so much so that the sand may leave the immediate gravity field from Ash Twin. This sand would get caught up by the gravitational forces of Ember Twin, but once more and more sand made its way to Ember Twin, there would be even more gravity adding to the tidal forces. It would have this sort of runaway effect that would present as what we see in the game. One of the main reasons that I don't think tidal forces could be the sole cause of this is the mostly carved out planet that is Ash Twin. I don't think that it would have enough mass to cause significant tides on Ember Twin when Ash Twin was empty. Really, I'm fine with just saying different physics or cool art choice, but if we visit the Quantum Moon's version of the planet, it was at one point a single planet, and the sand there seems to just be floating upwards, draining off slowly. Now, this sand could eventually be gravitationally drawn together, and this may have been what formed Ash Twin to begin with. But this kind of makes little real-world sense, as the sand would need horizontal velocity to stay in orbit. Oh, yeah, also, sand doesn't just float up into the sky, so there's that. 
but I thought it would be fun to try to come up with some explanations from our universe, so I'm sort of sticking with tides, plus an object in motion tends to stay in motion. I think one of the biggest obvious, but wait a minute, moments occurs on Brittle Hollow. We find out that the moon of Brittle Hollow has been pummeling the surface with lava balls for over 280,000 years, plus probably the whole lifespan of the planet. Yet, when we arrive on the surface and test the stability of the planet, we are told that the integrity of the surface is at 100%. And this doesn't seem too strange until these same lava balls start knocking off giant chunks of the surface, sending them falling into the black hole below. Now, most people don't really care about this and they just think it's awesome gameplay design and boom, that's that. But I think we can find some evidence in game for a reasonable explanation as to why this is. Again, if we visit the Quantum Moons version of Brittle Hollow, we find that the surface once looked very different. The surface seems to be a lot smoother on the Quantum Moons version of Brittle. Plus, looking up, we see that there are crystalline structures just floating above the surface. This is the result of the natural gravity effect the material of Brittle Hollow has, which allowed the Nomai to create gravity crystals. Comparing the surface of the Quantum Moon's Brittle Hollow to what we actually see on Brittle Hollow in-game now, these structures have completely disappeared. But we can imagine a Brittle Hollow with these structures still present. As the lava balls come raining down from Hollow's lantern, they'd have to come at an angle. They'd almost certainly hit these structures instead of hitting the surface. If the structures floating there have a gravity-based cushion between them and the surface, the surface would be almost completely spared from any repeated battering of the moon's volcano. And the gravitational push keeping the structures up would most likely prevent them from being pushed down to the surface, keeping them afloat. These structures would get hit so much that the lava would probably just grind them down into a dust. This could also help explain why Brittle Hollow's surface isn't as smooth as the surface we see on the Quantum Moon's version of it. The surface is all one piece, but the elevation is all over the place for different parts of the surface. This could be a combination of where the debris fell from the floating structures, making it higher, and where after those structures finally fell, the surface has been beaten and worn down by the lava, lowering it in other areas. Although, it'd still be thick enough to be stable for a while. Once the surface was worn down enough over the years, it would eventually start to finally crack through. And once some of the surface started cracking, the rest would be less stable and more prone to being knocked off itself. So essentially, when the Nomai were there, the surface was probably a bit smoother and thicker. And as small pieces kept getting knocked off, the surface got weaker and weaker. Until eventually, it's this brittle piece of crystal that we explore while playing the game. When we get there, the surface would still be strong enough to, without the effect of the lava coming down, to just stay in one piece forever. But as it keeps being battered and grinded and knocked off little by little, it becomes less and less stable. Now, as to how Hollow's Lantern has been able to stay full for its whole life, and yet drain in the 22 minutes we experience it, is pretty inexplicable. And here's the thing. Both the sand shifting and Brittle Hollow breaking up and even Hollow's Lantern can all just come down to design artistic or, you know, gameplay choices, and that'd be totally okay. There are a few places throughout the game that just don't vibe with real life, and I am not sweating it. There's just about no way the white hole would be a stationary object. It's not in orbit around the sun, and apparently gravity just ignores it. Same with the white hole station, the sun should just, boom, bring those things in. And really, any actual orbiting station that the Nomai made would likely have its orbit degrade and find itself falling back into the planet it's orbiting. Or maybe get slowed down by literally flying through the coronal emissions of the sun. We can chalk this up to design choices and the developers being the masters of this universe. Like, we may never know how the gravity cannon actually got the horizontal velocity to get into orbit, but it's not really that hard to assume the Nomai had some clever trick. Or maybe the sun station is using gravity tech to combat the pull from the sun. I just have a really good time trying to reason out the Outer Wilds universe, and really, trying to equate it as much to ours as possible. 
and I also have a good time making these videos and sharing them with you guys. Now hopefully, this video was interesting and made some sense to you guys. And if you enjoyed the video, consider supporting the channel by liking it and subscribing to the channel. It really does help. We're getting close to 7,000 subscribers, and that is very exciting to me. Now, if you'd like to support the channel more directly, you can become a member for $2 a month. And this unlocks a bunch of past live streams I've done that are usually at least an hour and a half long. You also get a special role in the Discord, as well as like icons next to your name in the comments, and you get a special thank you from me in every video. Which, of course, leads me to the special thank you to the members here on the channel. I really do appreciate all of you, so thank you all so very much. As always, this is the Lore Explorer, and I hope to see you all in the next video.